Our Spotlight section is our chance to shine a light on individuals, teams and their achievements and developments. We're really proud of our people at Combined and the amazing things they do, day in and day out. Here's our Medical Director, Dr Dennis Okolo, to introduce our next item. Many thanks Claire. As Claire said, at Combined Healthcare, we want to shine a spotlight on the excellent and compassionate care we provide. I hope you enjoy this next item, which gives you just one further example of just how and why we are proud to be outstanding in all we do and how we do it. My name is Darren Carr. I'm one of two consultant psychiatrists with the team and I'm also clinical director for the county directorate. As part of the, the medical team, we obviously offer outpatient appointments for patients including new assessments, so the doctors particularly will offer diagnostic expertise, so people who might have complex mental health needs that need some clarity, they want to know, perhaps their GP wants to know, and we need to know what their diagnosis is, if that's important to guide their treatment. Medics will also be primarily responsible for prescribing medication uh, for mental health problems and making sure that patients' physical health is prioritised. Hi, I'm Charlotte. I'm the team lead for the Moreland Community Mental Health Team. So over the last 12 months, we've had a big focus on upskilling the staff within the team. So we are utilising our own resources. And with this, we're building staff confidence, giving them new skills and opportunities. Um, we have managed to retain all of our staff members for the last 12 months as well. We've had a real focus on staff wellbeing, agile working, making sure that we do team building on away days. Uh, my name is Terry, I'm an admin apprentice. And the importance of the Ashram Centre in the community is having a service available to them that's close by. Um, they're not having to travel far to get to it um, and I think that's a positive thing for anybody really you know we have busy lives and we want to be able to access our services conveniently. Well for the last two and a half years I think it is now that I've been on the Ashcombe Centre um, honestly I can say that it's been life-changing um, Without the support that I've gotten from the Ashcombe Centre, I don't think I'd be where I am today. To be honest, I don't think I'd be here um, because they took me at my lowest point um, and you've just helped me build my confidence um, and helped me really push through the, the issues, the mentally health issues that I've had. And I think that working with the Ashcombe Centre has really made me be in a better place mentally um, and I don't know how to thank you guys because honestly I feel um, I feel very privileged and grateful that I got to work with such amazing people. Hi, uh, hi I'm James, I'm an occupational therapist and we're here today I believe to share our successes over the last 12 months. In March of last year um, we uh, got together with Changes uh, Combined Healthcare and we've now introduced a peer recovery coach into the team. Uh, and through this new initiative with Changes, we've been very fortunate to be involved with the development of the role of the programme as a supervisor. Uh, being able to offer interventions from another angle as a peer, reco peer recovery coach who has that lived experience uh, with a mental health illness, which has allowed them to share their journey and give hope to the service users who maybe we've had difficulty engaging with interventions in the past and um, this is providing really beneficial and en enhancing the reputation of the team. Hello, my name's Eve. I am an ARS practitioner in Moreland's Rural PCM. Um, just with regards to the successes over the last 12 months and relating them to the Ashcombe CMHT also, obviously we have set up this new service over the last 12 months. There has been a lot of successes um, as far as we're concerned, um, including um, an improvement in links between secondary care and primary care. Um, hopefully improvement with regards to the referral pathways between the two. 
There's been successes with regards to recruitment as well. Initially, there was 13 um, mental health practitioners. Um, there's now a further cohort of STR workers working within the community and strengthening mental health services there. So my name's Becky, I'm an occupational therapist and I've been with the Ashcombe Centre for about 18 months now. So this is my first post as a qualified occupational therapist. Um, the team's been really supportive and really helped me to build my confidence. They've been really encouraging and allowed me to support the anxiety and depression pathway. Um, which has currently been adapted to have more of an occupational therapy approach. So that's currently being piloted and it's going really well. Yeah, I was referred by the GP after having CBT and counselling um, because I was uh, really struggling with suicidal thoughts and a few other mental health problems after um, losing my sister. Um, they allocated me a care co, which has been with me ever since. Um, she's not only helped me, but she's helped my family members as well. I've been um, on the safety and stabilisation course, which deals with like things like past traumas and how to deal with them. I'm now on the coping skills, which deals you, it teaches you how to cope better in uh, situations, things like distress tolerance. So that's all helping me. Um, and now I'm a completely different person than I was just nearly 12 months ago. The team has worked incredibly hard. There have been a lot of challenges over the last few years, um, not least COVID, but we've also been playing our part in broader transformation as the as Staffordshire moves to the ICB. And another major success that we've got now is we link linking with the uh, vulnerability of networking within the CMH team is paramount to the support we can offer surface users. Uh, by, by being able to link in these various organisations uh, and the vulner Vulnerability Hub is chaired by Staffordshire Police and we have this weekly uh, and we have a number of vulnerable service users and it gives them that additional support, it helps them to pull them from potential crisis situations and put them back on the road to recovery uh, and since we've gone into the Covid and work in different ways it's now delivered over Microsoft Teams so there's a greater attendance which is just uh, enhancing the reputation of the Vulnerability Hub. Hi, my name's Dr Hashmi, I'm one of the junior doctors who works over here at the Ashcombe, I'm one of the core trainee psychiatrists. Okay, so as one of the junior doctors here, I sit in on the clinics, I see a lot of patients in my own clinics with supervision from the uh, senior doctors over here, um, and I help with sort of general day-to-day -day tasks such as checking blood tests, checking ECGs and helping with the day-to-day -day running of the centre. I'm Jade Bentley, I'm one of the community psychiatric nurses. So I've worked alongside the clinical psychologist to set up the trauma stabilisation pathway at the Ashcombe Centre to look at um, trauma recall, flashbacks, nightmares, dissociation um, and help people learn skills to manage those symptoms on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm Marianne, um, I'm the senior therapist within the Mourners Community Mental Health team. 12, within the past 12 months we formed a county psychology team, so that's myself, the psychologist here and the psychological therapists and psychologists at the Linebrook Centre. So we formed one team. And then what we've also been able to do is help to devise uh, and deliver um, psychological interventions. But the really most exciting thing is that we've been able to support our colleagues, nurses, occupational therapists, um, doctors, um, social work practitioners, to implement, to implement assessments using a formulation based approach and provide low intensity psychological interventions. So that, that's really exciting because it means that our service users have got greater access to a, a range of interventions. Being with yourselves just under what have been 11 months into coming up for probably give or take a bit. Um, yeah, it's, it's been different, I suppose. It's had a lot of help from Becky Barlow and James and Maxime. Um, Maxime's helped me whilst doing the A&D pathway. Um, helped me quite a lot. Been quite responsive as well. If we needed anything on the phone straight away. Been in a couple of crises last year. Again, quick to respond to. 
So the Askerson in secondary care, yeah, it, it's, it has been a good experience. So I'm one of the student links um, that works with Keel um, and we have about three to four students at a time. Um, so they observe, we help them build their skills, their confidence within nursing um, and then they move on from us. So within my role as one of the junior doctors here, um, I'm in part of a training pathway. So we rotate every six months um, between areas. So I've worked in inpatient units before and I've worked at other outpatient units before. So I'm just finishing up at the Ashcombe Centre. Um, and I think it's been really helpful for me to be here. It's helped me to develop as a doctor, develop as a person. And I've been really been glad to be part of the team. Uh, it's a really well-rounded and supportive team. And I can see that you know, every individual's got the patient's best interests at heart. Um, and I think you know, that's really something I've been able to learn from and gain experience from. And I think it's put me in a better stead for my future placements uh, going forward. So you know, I'm really glad to have come here. So my name's Shannon Bentley and I work for the Future Focus team um, and my role is basically working with people on their needs so it's supporting them, it's quite a diverse thing really because whatever it is that that person presents with then that's what we'll support them to do. So over the next 12 months, I'm hoping to set up the young persons group. I'm hoping to get that up and running, which is really exciting. Um, we're also continuing to work on supporting those with ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder. Um, we're hoping to be able to adapt our service to be able to suit their needs a little bit better and ensure that they're having the same outcomes as our other service users and are, aren't being discriminated against. I see the team go above and beyond their duties every day. Um, the changes we've been able to implement have had a real impact on the outcomes for the service users and the staff. We want to lead on transformation at the Ashcombe Centre. I think we have a track record of innovation. Um, being small allows us to do things quickly and I think the team are not ones to sit on their hands for very long. I think one of the things that's impressed me about working with my colleagues, we've got some older members of staff, we've got some people who've joined us more recently, and all of them have shown an appetite for doing things differently. Um, all of them are very, very patient-centred. I think when you're busy, when you're trying to deliver great patient care on limited resources, sometimes a casualty is your compassion and your kindness, and I think that our staff absolutely embody the trust values, a more caring, more kindly and more patient-centred team, I think it would be hard to imagine. And I'm extremely lucky to work with them. Patient and service user stories are just one way in which we get to hear the voice of those we serve. Here's our Executive Director of Nursing, Kenny Lang, to introduce our next item. Many thanks, Claire. Hearing the experiences of our staff and service users, carers and their families, delivered by them in their own words, provides insights and knowledge in a way that goes beyond the mere printed word. We use stories at our trust board, our committees, internal and engagement events. We also use them extensively across the web, digital and social media platforms. And that includes, of course, here on CTV. If you have ideas of a staff, a service user and or carer story, we need to hear it. Please get in touch with our patient experience facilitator or the comms team. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy the next item. We've had two really good experiences of combined healthcare. So one was last year when mum-in-law who'd got Alzheimer's um, took, took probably a number of falls, ended in the acute trust. Um, and and that was quite a difficult time for us. And she she ended up on, at the Harplands on Ward Four, and they kept her over Christmas and did the whole MDT thing. And they were super duper. There's no two ways about it. And they were very very supportive. Um, took me aback, I'll be honest, how supportive they were. But I knew every single day where we were at. Um, very well informed, even though we couldn't see Mum for obvious reasons. Um, I knew exactly where mum was at in her journey. So they helped us get her to get her into um, a residential home which is local to ourselves. And I never really settled, I don't think, if I'm honest. Um, but 
became, well, it got steadily worse. It's as, it's as simple as that. Um, so she sadly was sectioned um, uh, and ended up coming into ward, ward six a few years ago um, after, after we lost dad and mum was diagnosed. We made a promise to her. We made a promise that we would keep her smiling as long as we could. We'd keep her safe as we possibly could and we wouldn't let strangers into her, her home. And that was a biggie for us because we'd made that promise. So that sort of was was quite tough, her going into a residential home. Now, when she got onto Ward 6, and I know it's really difficult the first couple of days of her being there for obvious reasons, she was sectioned and, and, and it was really difficult. The first thing that hit me was she was comfortable she was smiling again, so she obviously felt safe. She smiled at the nurses and it felt that the way she talked about them, although she couldn't identify them, they were almost like they were her family, so they were no longer strangers. So everything that we promised in that in that is saying this is very emotive, isn't it? It's all about us as a family, but everything we promised, Ward 6 gave her. And that is in a nutshell, that's why I wanted to shout from the rooftops because they gave us back what we promised her. Um, gosh, I can't believe I'm going to stop. <laughs> they, they became a family to her and to us. They, they didn't fail us at all in any way, shape or form. Kirsten at the front door, when she took the calls, she knew exactly who she was talking to. She didn't need to ask. She knew it was me at certain times in the morning. She knew, you know, what questions I would want. To. She'd already got the answers. She didn't need to go off and find somebody who knew or somebody's on a lunch break or it's not their side or it's, you know, they all, and no matter who picked that phone up, they all knew of her. So it's not necessarily sometimes what they did, it's how they made us all feel. So to see her from going from somebody that was very upset and very, very, very angry, so very angry with life and very confused, but to see her smiling and singing, it, that was just, I think that blew us all, both of us out of the water. My, my husband's quite a tough, tough chappy, you know, tough man, but he, even he got a tear in his eye when he started to, when she started to sing. Um, comfortable clean, tidy, you know, her hair was lovely, albeit it needed cutting for her dues, but the, she just looked like the proud woman, albeit frail, she looked like the proud woman she's always been. And we hadn't seen that for a few months. Jo was just absolutely out of this world. They all were, they all were. But when Jo phoned to do the call, we had the call around um, when she was deemed as end of life, um she bent over backwards to make sure we got everything we needed for mum and then towards the end they made it so possible for us it was it was incredible actually so they moved her room so that she's on an end room which was by the four the, the courtyard outside so we had 24 hour access how thoughtful is that they made us feel um listened to I think they made us feel special as a family and recognize that this was a very special time nothing was too much trouble we didn't ask for loads because we didn't need loads but they were absolutely there the night that she before she died all the staff stayed over 10 minutes just to come just to come and say goodbye um and it's things like that that's the bit that makes it special um you know, she was well looked after, well thought of by everybody. Um, and so and so were we. So were we. Um, I just I, I say I think the whole the whole experience has left us just quite humbled, really. You listen. And I think that's the bit for me. And it's the difference between you either listen to respond or you listen to understand. And 
they listen to understand. So whatever it is you're doing around listening, and I think it's ingrained in mental health training as well anyway. And I think that's where, you know, some of our registered nurses like myself could learn something. But the, the biggie for me is you you listened. You listened to what we were saying. You, able, All of them were able to play that back in a way that then made sense. So I knew they'd understood what we were saying. Um, and, 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 and that played out. So Jo said to us, she said, I know you said you wanted all to be able to say you, you goodbyes. Shall we do that now together? And you, all four of you, go and just get some shut eye in the day room. She said, I will stay with it. Uh, and that's what she did. And I know there was, you know, there was probably other, a million other things she could have been doing. A million other things, I'm pretty sure of it. But she didn't. She sat with it. Oh, I think you ought to be doing end of life services. If that's the service that you get. <laughs> Then why on earth aren't you doing end of life services as part of your your business? Um, because we'd certainly, yeah, absolutely. I think getting into your units are tricky. <laughs> the waiting lists are tricky. We had to wait a little while to get to get her in the first time round. Obviously, second time round we didn't because she was sectioned. So I think from a family point of view, we we will be eternally grateful for to you guys for giving us those happy memories um, in a really awful time um, because they are they were happy we, we, we were happy and that includes Mo and um, we were happy and that's the bit that was really important is there something about how you celebrate success um, because you hear an awful lot about the Royal Stoke. Um, not a lot of people. Oh, I don't get the impression that that we hear a lot about combined. If I'm honest, shout about shout about your services. And oh, and why I say that is my husband who's who's a joiner. He he had no idea that Harplands was separate to Royal Stoke. All the board, all the board really cited on what their teams do day in and day out. Do they really, really see it? And do they not appreciate it? That's the wrong thing. But do they really, really celebrate it? Because um, if they don't, they should. They should be really proud of their their teams. But I'd, I'd really like to think that Ward Six knows that they are appreciated um, and they must do because they wouldn't perform like they do must they but I'd really really like to think with my hand on my heart as each and every one of those men those team uh, the team knows that they're really appreciated thank you to all to all of them from all of us from all of us in the family not just me just because I'm under the voice piece um, from from each and every one of us we wouldn't have wanted to have done it without you they all did the right thing by us. You know, and when I say us, I mean Mo in that. They absolutely nailed, nailed it for us all the way through.
proud of the leading role we play in our local integrated care system Together We're Better. By working together in partnership with colleagues in the wider NHS, the care system, local government and the third sector, we achieve far more together than we can achieve alone. Here's just some examples of what's going on around our local system this week. Hi, I'm Bukia Adiemo, Chief Executive at North Staffordshire Combined Healthcare, NHS Trust. At Combined, we've always known that achieving something outstanding for the first time is only the start of a journey. The real challenge is maintaining that achievement year on year. Today, I want to let you know about another fabulous example of how we're managing to do precisely that. Exactly a year ago, it was both my pleasure and my privilege to share with you all the fantastic news that in the National NHS Staff Survey, we had achieved some of the best results in the NHS across the people promise. Today, 
The results of the NHS Staff Survey 2022 are published and once again I'm really proud to tell you that our people have maintained that remarkable achievement. It's my pleasure to invite Paul Draycott, Director of People, Organisational Development and Inclusion, to tell you more. I think it's safe to say that it's been uh, another great year. Um, as you can see, we've had uh, the highest response rate we've ever had uh, as an organisation. 69.2% of you um, decided that you were going to give us some feedback on what it was like to work at the Trust, which is fantastic. And that actually, against other mental health um, trusts, was the highest response rate of any organisation. So thank you for responding, for giving us your voice, for telling us what it's actually like to work at Combined. We really appreciate it. And it'll help us now in terms of our next step, because there's plenty of good things and there's plenty for us to improve on, to make it an even better place to work. So you may remember from last year's results, there are the, the results come in, in nine different segments, um, seven related to the people promise, which we'll touch on in a minute, and these are the two, staff engagement and staff morale. Both of those, collectively, we scored the best scores against our, our um, cohort, against other similar mental health learning disability trusts. The other areas um, of the people promise, which is the national people promise, the promise to all of the people working in the NHS, um, come in seven different areas. These are the, the first four, as you can see here. Um, recommended, recognised and rewarded, always learning, flexibility and team. These four, we actually came again top against all of our, our cohort, all the Mental Health and Learning Disability Trust. The other three areas um, in the People Promise, which was compassionate and inclusive, a voice that counts, and safe and healthy, the three that we've got here, um, we didn't come top, but we came 0.1 um, behind the top trust in our cohort on that. So a really great set of results and, and thank you for everything that all of you have done to get us into that place. Because it's not about the board or you know, one or two people across the organisation in leadership positions. This is about all of you, the way that you make the place feel, the way that you create the right environment for us to provide the best possible care that we can for the people that use our services. Patient and service user stories are just one way in which we get to hear the voice of those we serve. Here's our Executive Director of Nursing, Kenny Lang, to introduce our next item. Many thanks, Claire. Hearing the experiences of our staff and service users, carers and their families, delivered by them in their own words, provides insights and knowledge in a way that goes beyond the mere printed word. We use stories at our trust board, our committees, internal and engagement events. We also use them extensively across the web, digital and social media platforms. And that includes, of course, here on CTV. If you have ideas of a staff, a service user and or carer story, we need to hear it. Please get in touch with our patient experience facilitator or the comms team. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy the next item. The team has worked incredibly hard. There have been a lot of challenges over the last few years, um, not least COVID, but we've also been playing our part in the broader transformation as the as Staffordshire moves to ICB. Yeah, I was referred by the GP after having CBT and counselling um, because I was uh, really struggling with suicidal thoughts and a few other mental health problems after um, losing my sister. Um, they allocated me a care co, and she's been with me ever since. Um, she's not only helped me, but she's helped my family members as well. I've been um, on the safety and stabilisation course, which deals with like things like past traumas and how to deal with them. I'm now on the coping skills, which deals you, it teaches you how to cope better in uh, situations, things like distress tolerance. So that's all helping me. Um, and I'm now, I'm a completely different person than I was just nearly 12 months ago. Well, for the last 
two and a half years, I think it is, now that I've been in the Ashcombe Centre. Um, honestly, I can say that it's been life-changing. Um, without the support that I've gotten from the Ashcombe Centre, I don't think I'd be where I am today. To be honest, I don't think I'd be here um, because they took me at my lowest point um, and you've just helped me build my confidence um, and helped me really push through the the issues, the mental health issues that I've had. And I think that working with the Ashcombe Centre has really made me be in a better place mentally. Um, and I don't know how to thank you guys because honestly, I feel, um, I feel very privileged and grateful that I got to work with such amazing people. Being with yourselves just under, what have been now, 11 months since it coming up for probably give or take a bit. Um, yeah, it's, it's been different, I suppose. It's had a lot of help from Becky Barlow and James and Maxime. Um, Maxime's out me whilst doing the A&D pathway. Um, me quite a lot. Been quite responsive as well. If we needed anything on the phone straight away. Been in a couple of crises last year. Again, quick to respond to. So yes, considering secondary care, yeah, it's 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 just been a good experience. Our spotlight section is our chance to shine a light on individuals, teams and their achievements and developments. We're really proud of our people at Combined and the amazing things they do, day in and day out. 
The Darwin Centre is combined regional 15 bedded inpatient unit, providing specialist mental health services for young people and their families. This week, the Darwin Centre gained a new colleague, a 16-week-old Springer Spaniel puppy called Kiara, who has been introduced to the centre by her owner and CAM psychiatry consultant, Mike Foster. Kiara is the centre's new emotional support dog and it was her first day on Thursday. The centre now has two support dogs, including another of Mike's dogs called Rupert, who has been a reliable presence at the centre, but he has sadly been diagnosed with kidney failure. Kiara will bring some younger energy and it definitely looked like she was settling in already when we went to visit her and Mike. Kiara's role will be to facilitate conversation between Mike and service users on the ward, giving them a boost of self-esteem and oxytocin and playing with the puppy. Mike spoke of the research behind having an emotional support dog and the benefits it has revealed. Based on the evidence in research, as well as the service evaluation with our other emotional support dog, Rupert, we know that having a dog at the Darwin Centre can be deeply beneficial for both the staff and service users. By the time we visited in the late morning, Kiara had already met one service user at the centre who had a very positive interaction with the friendly puppy, and Mike explained how the dog would be based in the office initially, getting used to the centre and then move on to the ward in the coming weeks as she adjusts. Kiara has clearly been a welcome addition to the centre. Catherine Smith is the ward manager who seemed delighted with her newest team member. We've noticed that having an emotional support dog on the ward enhances engagement from the service users. Kiara brings warmth to the unit and puts a smile on the faces of everybody here. We look forward to following Kiara as she grows up and seeing how she provides a calming, affectionate atmosphere to our service users at the Darwin Centre. Our spotlight section is our chance to shine a light on individuals, teams and their achievements and developments. We're really proud of our people at Combined and the amazing things they do, day in and day out. Here's our medical director, Dr Dennis Okolo, to introduce our next item. Many thanks Claire. As Claire said, at Combined Healthcare we want to shine a spotlight on the excellent and compassionate care we provide. I hope you enjoy this next item, which gives you just one further example of just how and why we are proud to be outstanding in all we do and how we do it. So I'm Dr. Becky Chubb. I'm a old age psychiatrist and I work as a locum consultant here. So I've been with Combined about five years now. 
and I'm a little bit unusual in that I've literally gone full circle and by that I mean gone round the world and come back to Stoke-on-Trent which I never thought would happen but I'm very glad it has. So um, I trained as a junior doctor in the area and I did a job in the trust as a foundation year two doctor and then life took me to New Zealand, I've done different jobs, I worked as a GP for a while and then when I returned to the UK this was the place that I had the fondest memories of really so I got in touch and managed to get a job here again. People should come and work here principally because of the culture that we have here. Um, it's a small trust but it's a really really friendly trust. Um, as doctors we move around the country, we work in lots of different trusts and I can't remember working in a different area where I might bump into my director or medical director in a day and say hello. Um, and it's really friendly when people, you know, call you and, and they may be calling you to ask you to do something, they also ask you if you're okay. And they genuinely mean it. They're not saying, you know, hey, how are you, just to get onto the task. They genuinely mean, how are you? When was the last time you took some annual leave? And, and I think over the last couple of years in particular, do you know what, That's, that means a lot. So we're in Stoke-on-Trent um, in Staffordshire and I think Staffordshire is one of those areas that unless you perhaps have lived here or have a relative here or reason for coming, it's maybe not a county that you perhaps know much about. You might have been to Alton Towers perhaps or something like that, but otherwise you may not know Staffordshire. Um, but it's a fantastic county. It's got beautiful, beautiful countryside and green areas, um, which are just absolutely lovely. Um, it takes me about 15 minutes to get to work and I live in a village that's very rural and green and beautiful. Um, and it makes, especially now we're all working from home a little bit more than we used to, it makes that so easy for me that I only have to get in the car and drive for 15 minutes to get to the hospital. I think, make a phone call, come and have a conversation with us, come and see if what I'm talking about lives up to reality, because I guarantee it will. We're a really friendly bunch. We would love to have a conversation with anybody that's wanting to come and work here. Um, it's a great trust and like I say, I've worked in a lot of different places and I have no reason to move anywhere else. I'm, I'm very happy here, so come and have a conversation.
At Combined, we celebrate our people and team's fantastic track record in securing achievements, awards and accolades. Here's our Chair David Rogers to introduce our next item. Many thanks, Claire. As Claire said, at Combined Healthcare, we're always keen to celebrate the fantastic things that our people and teams do. Whether that's delivering brilliant, compassionate care, developing innovations and new services, or securing external or national recognition. One of my most pleasurable experiences each year is hosting our annual REACH Awards, our showcase event. But we don't just want to celebrate achievement once a year. We want to do it continually. And CTV is one way in which we're able to do so. I hope you enjoy this next item, which gives you just one further example of just how and why we are proud to be outstanding in all we do and how we do it. Thank you everyone for being here today. For those who don't know me, I'm Ben Richards, I'm the director of the Trust, but I'm also the, the Trust Board Lead for, for Veterans and, and Military Families. So, um, just over a year ago, um, we reaffirmed as a Trust our commitments to the Armed Forces Covenant. Um, and then, um, following some conversations with David from the Veterans Healthcare Alliance, we, we started on our journey to become veterans um, aware, I have to make sure I get the words right, um, which was about um, an external evaluation of, of the services that we provide to veterans and their families, and, and in recognition that some of the disadvantages that they face. Um, and, but in the typical combined way, um, we were very clear that it wasn't a tick box exercise that would just get us over the line. If we were going to do this, we were going to do it properly. Um, and so we formed a project board and there's some you know, a number of people from that project board here today, and it was very much clinically there. And, and we've done a range of things from changing our HR policies to make sure people can, can be active in the reservists or the cadets, um, to increase op employment opportunities for those leaving the forces, and in particular for those people accessing healthcare services to make sure that they, as one example, if they move around the country, they don't go to the back of the queue. So we've made some huge changes, and I think David and part of the evaluation has fed back that people can see how we've embraced this and how it will continue now, and that, and that work will come on. But for us to get this accreditation and recognition of, of the work that the teams have done uh, is a pleasure to, to be there. And we did say as a, as a board that we would like to be there by the 31st of March. So, so we are here and got our accreditation in time. So, so um, thank you to everyone uh, involved. It, it has been a real pleasure um, to do that. And you know, our partners at UHNM just up the road, they're also accredited, um, which is great. And we're now involved with the County Council's um, Armed Forces work stream as well. So we're linking in across the, the various areas, including employment. So thank you everyone for coming, and I'll mm -hmm. hand back to David. Yeah, it is great that we can unite effectively with our friends across the car park, mm -hmm. on physical and mental, without having to go anywhere else. Anyway, we've got Ian with us, who's going to do something quite dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I can just, just say a few words before I do this, uh, and I must say that the Duke of Edinburgh would have been delighted to see something as straightforward as that. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I firstly uh, say how delighted I am to be here representing His Majesty to, uh, to recognise this auspicious occasion, firstly. Uh, and secondly, can I offer my warmest congratulations to all of you who've been involved. Under the overall banner of the Armed Forces Covenant, which started almost around the same time I was appointed back in 2012, so I've had the privilege of watching this um, overall uh, aim and objective develop. And certainly within um, the VCHA, I know you've been very successful in, in working towards getting all the trusts Credited with this uh, with this standard, so my warmest congratulations. Not least because we have a pretty large uh, military and, and veteran communities here in, in Staffordshire, North Staffordshire, and so on their behalf, 
and I thank hey, you for making this good. Share you all. And without further ado, pleasure to. Yeah, it's going to be on the. So my name's Lucy Rigby um, and I've been in the uh, mental health services um, since, since I was 17 years old, so that's 20 years now. Um, first ever Harpins admission um, was the second week it opened actually um, and I went there and then since I've had different experiences generally um, in hospital quite an amount of time, um, been in a resource centre um, a few times that used to be called the Bennett Centre. My diagnosis is basically com quite complex, as people call me, because it's more than one thing. Um, I have been diagnosed with um, parasitophrenia. Um, I'm on antidepressants and anxiety medication. Um, I've got quite bad OCD. Um, and I've also got diagnosed, I think it was early last year, PTSD, because over my life, there's been some... I've, I've, I've moved around as well from place to place. I've just had a very, very bad bad experience. It's a hell of a lot that's happened all these years. And it's, and it's just a sort of, it just builds up and builds up and then they end up getting sectioned and going to hospital. So it isn't like one thing that's sort of triggered it. It's, it's a collection of things. And over the years, it's just really bad things that have happened, really. Um, that I'm sort of, that I find it hard to cope with. I've had quite a few things done. I've had a lot, lot of neuro tests done on my brain and things. Um, I've had also, um, they provided sort of holistic therapies there a few years ago, but I don't think they're particularly doing now. Um, and the lady sort of um, did like um, acupuncture and things at the time. Um, and like real, proper relaxation, which I thought was quite good. All the times I used to go into hospital, I used to apparently say to my mum, I hate the staff, I hate the staff. She says, but then when you get well, Lucy, you love the staff. But it was sort of years ago, it was old school, really. It was like, um, there was like, especially the health care, because the nurses had been in the office quite a bit. But the health care were older. And there was a couple that were sort of like matron style staff. And they'd have, they'd have like put things in place, like you had to shrug your own bed on a Saturday. And they also used to say, You're not coming outside of, the, of your room until you've got something on your feet. And at the time, they were thinking, You know, shut up and, you know, that type of thing. But I do feel that that was the best way for us. Bit of structure, I think. But like, there was especially these two women who nursed me and I used to call them my fairy godmothers for some strange reason. And they could be pains, but it was better. In the experience as well, I've had four full courses of ECT, one by a man named Dr. George, and he was the fantastic doctor ever. Again, he was old school and he was fantastic. I'm not sort of saying, oh, get rid of all the young ones and get the older ones out. I just feel like I keep saying there's something missing, that sort of special ingredient that's missing. But I can't sort of say what the um, answer is really. But like, you know, it's like the staff who found out that, you know, you're there, you know, and I knock in my room one night. And it was a night she actually says, hi, Lucy. I would say it's nice to see you, but not in these circumstances. And you know, when you've got people like that who knew you when you were younger and come and check on you, mate, looking after you, they say, and, you know, it's that kind of thing that makes you feel so nice. You know, it's a bit of comfort, in a way, seeing a family face and they're quite nice to you because you're going through hell in your mind.
integrated care system Together We're Better. By working together in partnership with colleagues in the wider NHS, the care system, local government and the third sector, we achieve far more together than we can achieve alone. Here's just some examples of what's going on around our local system this week. I'm very pleased to introduce to you our quality strategy. This is a key organisational strategy which describes the priorities and methodology for how we as an NHS Trust will continue to deliver services which aim to meet the needs of our local population over the coming years. Following the CQC inspection of the Trust in 2016, we received a good rating and immediately launched our campaign towards outstanding. This set ourselves the aim of providing the highest quality clinical care and ensuring excellence in mental health and learning disability services. We sought to evidence this through our approach to achieving outstanding rating by the CQC, which we achieved in 2019. We have bold plans for service transformation across a number of our services over the next five years. The NHS long-term plan and mental health implementation plan set out significant investment in mental health services and over the life of this strategy we will shape the detail of what this means for us at a local level in North Staffordshire and Stoke-on-Trent. 
our quality strategy aims to support and deliver the local mental health implementation plan. Recognise the importance of focusing on quality as the developments proposed within the mental health implementation plan are implemented. We intend to strengthen our culture of strong clinical leadership and this will be critical to the successful implementation of this strategy. To ensure success, our clinical and management practice and behaviours will be focused on distributed leadership, multidisciplinary team working, continuous improvement, all with the core purpose of providing outstanding care for our service users and their families. During 2020, more than ever before, the impact of COVID-19 has shone a light on the health inequalities which are experienced locally, nationally and across the globe. A number of our communities have been disproportionately directly impacted by the virus and will also feel the wider impacts of the virus in relation to the mental health and well-being for years to come. Those with mental health conditions and learning disabilities have significantly poorer health and well-being outcomes than those of the general population including complex physical health problems and earlier death. To be outstanding in all we do and how we do it, we must all fulfil a role in tackling these inequalities. We aim to achieve the commitments of this quality strategy through harnessing the potential contained within our workforce, our service users and carers, to further embed quality and performance using our SPA quality priorities each year of this life strategy to provide the best care they can. So, how are we going to do this? We aim to be the provider of the highest quality mental health and learning disability services in the NHS. We will be relentless in our pursuit of identifying and reducing harm, including human, process and systemic errors which could cause harm to people. In mental health, this will also include self-harm and suicide. We'll have clear cycles for reviewing the effectiveness and responsiveness of our service provision with key partners across health and social care, including most importantly, service users and carers. Our clinical staff will provide interventions and care which is evidence-based and targeted to the population we serve. It will make use of the latest technology and innovation to ensure effectiveness will provide care which is person-centred and responsive to people's needs and reflective of their beliefs, culture and spirituality. Our approach to achieving consistently high quality has four key components. The first one, planning for quality. We will ensure that our clinical services meet the needs of our service users and population. We will ensure clinical practice is based upon the best evidence and innovative practice using our clinicians, service users and local, regional and national networks. We'll have a good assurance mechanisms. So we'll undertake periodic reviews using different um, things such as audit, internal insurance visits, peer reviews and make sure that good care is being delivered in keeping with the terms of our CQC registration. We will identify and deliver actions to address any identified deficits. The third, quality control. We will have effective operational management, which will monitor performance and quality metrics in clinical services and intervene when necessary to ensure quality is maintained. This will include the use of safety huddles, team meetings, and reviewing quality as part of day-to-day -day business as usual. And lastly, quality improvement. We'll use QI methodology to identify, test and implement changes required to tackle complex issues. This will involve all of our clinical teams, service users, working together with QI experts in close detail with those who understand the issues most. We will have agreed processes and structures in all services, including community-based services, to ensure that safe staffing is in place to meet the needs of the people in our communities. We will have leadership development opportunities available to all clinical and managerial staff. We will invest in staff to have pathways for, to further their knowledge, skills and careers. 
and we will make full use of technology to deliver outstanding care and support our staff to work effectively. We will ensure that development of the new integrated care partnerships, our places and primary care networks, which are our communities, are focused on quality as defined in this strategy. The services which the Trust will provide in partnership will clearly reflect the needs of our communities. This will be empirically based on the evidence of need and rationale of how we deliver these services will be based on what our people, both staff and service users tell us. There will be integrated care pathways working across NHS, local government, citizens and voluntary, community and social enterprise organisations, delivering effective seamless care and treatment for our communities. We will work with our health and social care partners in our communities to identify and address health inequalities and have plans to address them. And we will have multidisciplinary working between clinical and academic partners, including joint clinical academic roles with local universities and all trust professional groups will be regularly publishing in academic journals. We will utilise various approaches to ensuring our services are sustainable and effective and efficient. We will use benchmarking data to challenge ourselves, identifying variation in our services when comparing ourselves with other organisations. When identifying this variation, we'll have processes to interrogate, analyse and understand this variance to identify whether it's warranted or unwarranted variation. Where unwarranted variation exists, we will apply quality improvement methodology to drive process improvement, evidence change and spread good practice. We will undertake quality improvement assessments through the lens of our quality priorities, that is safe, personalised, accessible and recovery focused, to ensure that all aspects of quality are considered and where possible we will seek to improve quality in every organisational change process we make. We will use technology appraisals in redesigning our service, services to make sure that models of care incorporate innovation and enable us to respond to the needs of our communities. Many thanks for taking the time to learn a little about our aims and ambitions for our quality strategy as we look beyond 2020. I really look forward to hearing your views and working with you all as our fantastic future unfolds. Well, with regards to staff, I mean, my support workers, I've got Anne Hill and I've got um, Jackie at the 24 7, and I've got Joe as a care coach, and I honestly call them my dream team because they're so good with me because they know how to act with me. Anne knows me inside and out, knows where our confidence It's they, they've just got the knack, they've got something there, they know how to talk to you, they know how to treat you. You know, it's like if you're out of order, they'll tell you. And then you think, okay, yeah, sorry. But, I don't know. It's like me and we just have really good chats. And I feel like I can tell them anything because I have such horrible thoughts. And it makes me feel really low. And you can't always disclose them to your mum and dad. But with Anne and Jackie, as soon as I answer the phone, or they look at me, they know straight away. So I don't know how they did it really, but you could do with them being in the hospital. In some ways, if you've had it so long, you sort of know how to cope with it a bit better. But I think there needs to be something more when you leave hospital that is there. It's like the clubhouses, I go to the 24-7. Obviously, that's been shut for a long time. But I think that there needs to be like places where you could go and, I don't know, just more sort of an interaction. And I mean, years ago, I'm sure there used to be like a walking group. And I think we used to get on the bus, a few of us, and go somewhere on the bus for the day. And, you know, I mean, could that be made aware to some others who are entirely on their own? Because a lot of people mental health have got a free bus pass. Because... I mean, in my case, my medication knocked me out. I wouldn't be able to drive. And I don't know, just things like that. And I think we went, 
Who went to Stafford one day, and this was years ago, went back in a cafe and had a bit of dinner, and it was just nice to interact with people, especially on the weekend, because if you go to a group in the week and then you go from Friday till Monday and you're not too clever and you just need a bit of morale, it's a long weekend, it really is. Yeah, the home treatment team, basically, that's the time particularly when I have been sectioned because the last time I refused to do anything with the home treatment. I found in a lot of other people, patients as well, who have known over the years, I've still got the negative thing against them because they, they're, they're only liable. Sometimes they say, oh, yes, we're coming such a date. Then they ring you. Oh, we're not coming, just telephone. Well, anybody can speak on the phone and have a nice voice. But somebody could be sitting down on the phone, rocking and doing all sorts. You, you know, how can they make sure you're all right when they're not physically there looking at you? Do you know what I mean? And also, like, um, when they do come, you feel like you're being rushed. It's like the same direct question, and they just want to be in and out. I don't know if it's because of how they are or the caseload, again. But, you know, we are, we, um, it's not very good, really. Um, like I said, mostly cancelled appointments, or they just come to you for five minutes, and then they're out the door again. And you just think, Oh, they must have been that interested. Not that you want attention, but it's always nice to try and have a talk to somebody to get it off your chest and they just haven't, it just appears that they haven't got the time. Um, when they are qualifying people and things, how do, how do they know that person is right for the job? Um, you know, it's more than sort of paperwork. It's got to be character as well as the person. And I don't see them point, making time to make appointments with nurses and health cares to get that sort of inclination when you're in a conversation with them. So basically, they're just getting the jobs because of their written down credentials. Bugger, bugger what type of person they are inside. So I think that's important. And there should, there should be something like some kind of, maybe like a patient regulation scheme. Whereas... Obviously, we wouldn't go into personal things of nurses and things, but things that we could, so that they could come to us. Like if we have like a patient group, they could come to us and we could sort of not scout them, but sort of, you know, it's a bit, like they, if they gave the option, would you like to go see like a patient's meeting where you can go in and meet the patients? They can tell us what their experience, what they want. And then we could maybe be sort of in, a little bit more involved more.
We really hope you're enjoying watching Combined TV. If you have a story, a topic or an idea that you would like featured on the show, we'd love to hear it. You can email us at ctv at combined.nhs.uk. Okay, my name is Darren Carr. I'm one of two consultant psychiatrists with the team. and I'm also clinical director for the county directorate. As part of the, the medical team, we obviously offer outpatient appointments for patients, including new assessments. So the doctors particularly will offer diagnostic expertise. So people who might have complex mental health needs that need some clarity, they want to know, perhaps their GP wants to know, and we need to know what their diagnosis is, if that's important to guide their treatment. Medics will also be primarily responsible for prescribing medication uh, for mental health problems and making sure that patients' physical health is prioritised. The team has worked incredibly hard. There have been a lot of challenges over the last few years, um, not least COVID, but we've also been playing our part in broader transformation as the as Staffordshire moves to ICB. Um, as part of our transformation, we've received some new roles to the team. So we now have a pharmacist for the first time who is embedded within the team and is going to be working with us to ensure that we prescribe effectively and safely and that also physical health monitoring is, is done properly and, and that we interface and liaise effectively with GP colleagues. We've had other staff, so we've now got um, future focus staff. We have um, some additional community workers. We interface really well with um, our PCN mental health colleagues. And I think we have an incredibly good relationship with our two PCN mental health nurses and that's helped deepen our relationships with GPs. I think our relationship with GPs in the Moorlands is really strong. You know, we often will visit them face to face. Many of them will WhatsApp me, phone me. Um, and I would hope that GP colleagues would say we offer a really responsive and accessible service. So those our staffs have been, our staff have been really key in that and have Eve and Claire doing those roles. Um, we also have our junior doctors who again worked incredibly hard over the last two years. We have both higher trainees here and core trainees. We also train GP VTS doctors who are going to become GPs, so giving them a, a really good experience of mental health. So despite the fact that we've been under a lot of significant challenges, we've done a lot of transformation work. A big part of what we've done over the last year is really embed our clinical pathways and the Ashcombe Centre is our smallest CMHT, but being small allows us to be quite agile, it allows us to make change at pace, and we have led on the development of, of a number of our clinical pathways which will now be rolling out across, across the trust. And the team, I think, have really had an appetite for taking on new roles. So we have an advanced nurse practitioner who's developed our ADHD service, our qualified members of staff, our nurses, our OTs, our social workers, nearly all of them have shown a real enthusiasm for developing new skills. So we used to be very reliant on psychologists to provide our psychological therapies. We've now got our nurses, our OTs, our social workers running a lot of our groups. And that means more patients can benefit from evidence-based treatments without long waits. We want to lead on transformation at the Ashcombe Centre. I think we have a track record of innovation. Um, being small allows us to do things quickly. And I think the team are not ones to sit on their hands for very long. I think one of the things that's impressed me about working with my colleagues, we've got some older members of staff, we've got some people who've joined us more recently, and all of them have shown an appetite for doing things differently. Um, all of them, are very, very patient-centered. I think when you're busy, when you're trying to deliver great patient care on limited resources, sometimes a casualty is your compassion and your kindness. And I think that our staff absolutely embody the trust values, a more caring, more kindly, and more patient-centered team. I think it would be hard to imagine. And I'm extremely lucky to work with them.
Step on is the IPS service for North Staffordshire Combined Healthcare Trust and Midlands Foundation Partnership Trust. We support anybody who wants to work and is involved in secondary mental health services. We work with people generally on a one-to-one -one basis, so it allows us time to get to know people and to find out perhaps some of their barriers to employment. And it's all about what support that person needs and about how we're going to support you to move on. I've always felt guilty about not working and I just thought I want to do something, I want to change my life. My doctors told me that there was this programme that could help me find a job that suited me. To be able to get into a job and then furthermore get off the benefits and say thank God, that's a stress that I don't have to deal with now. We're starting from the very beginning, find out about them. Let's look for things that interest them, that spark something in them. We start looking at confidence building, interviewing skills, CV writing, just getting them used to kind of looking for work. At my age, I never had to do a CV, so, you know, that was a, a big thing in itself. They actually gave me proper practical steps and advice as well as interview techniques, you know, that actually work. Helen met me before the interview and helped me prepare for it, so I didn't feel quite so daunted by the thought of it. They've helped me control my anxiety, bring it to a level. We've explored why I got anxious and what we could do to overcome those times. The improvement in somebody's mental health from doing something that is meaningful is absolutely amazing. It gives give you the confidence to apply for jobs that can keep you in meaningful employment. You reach your potential. They've got some responsibility, they've got a routine, they're earning their own money and you see mental health services starting to take a step back because they can see this person is improving. My hours have increased already, I passed my probation period, it's been great, it's just helped me so much. After three months of doing the job I've been discharged and I never thought I would be discharged. I don't feel worthless anymore. Me and my support worker, we still meet up with coffees, we still talk on a regular basis. I always feel like I can go to her and say, this has happened, I really need your help. They don't give up on you just because you've got a job. That's one of the most brilliant things about Step On. To be able to, to have somebody with them that supports and believes in them, can help them see that there is hope and there is a future. I definitely say that they're the place to go because they're just there to give you support and, and they do 100%, they're, they're brilliant. It's just nice to feel like I'm heading somewhere now and I'm in a job that I love. I feel as if my life is just starting again and if I hadn't been referred to step on I would have never have had that. At Combined, we celebrate our people and team's fantastic track record in securing achievements, awards and accolades. Here's our Chair David Rogers to introduce our next item. Many thanks, Claire. As Claire said, at Combined Healthcare, we're always keen to celebrate the fantastic things that our people and teams do. Whether that's delivering brilliant, compassionate care developing innovations and new services, or securing external or national recognition. One of my most pleasurable experiences each year is hosting our annual REACH Awards, our showcase event. But we don't just want to celebrate achievement once a year. We want to do it continually. And CTV is one way in which we're able to do so. I hope you enjoy this next item, which gives you just one further example of just how and why we are proud to be outstanding in all we do and how we do it. Yeah. 
It does make you realise though when you we take people's glasses off and hearing aids that what we actually do to them. I know it's do you know what I mean? It's like everything went, it was already a bit blurred and then it went completely blurred and then you just see all these voices. So yeah, it is good. It does make you think. After coming out of that wheel, because it's all consuming, so you're looking around and you can, you're literally in the room as you, with the environment around you. It's very well put together, really good. And, and what, what did you think about what, what you saw? What you, did, did you feel like you were experiencing it from the point of view of the patient? Yeah, you did. I think it was really helpful to see the, the changeable presentations and that one minute sort of everything was clear, then the next minute it was all very fuzzy and there was sirens going off and um, there was smoke coming out of the vents and um, again, seeing how the patient would have interpreted what the staff were doing as well. Surreal, yeah. It's um, yeah, very strange, really. It's um, it really is. But I mean, quite beneficial, I think. Um, yeah, to actually give that insight into uh, what the patients are actually um, experiencing, I suppose, is um, yeah, very interesting for us because obviously we see it on a regular basis here, but we don't really know what it's like for that patient to, uh, to actually un you know, to suffer from delirium. Yeah. So yeah, um, yeah, really. Uh, very powerful, I would yeah. say. It's uh, all the colours and all the things and one us with the uh, hallucinations and uh, the VR really does capture that quite well. So. Oh God, oh God, it's me they're talking about. It's going to be me next. It's completely immersive to be able to sit there and have a patient's view of what it feels like when we go up to patients, we remove their senses, so we take away their hearing, we take away their sight. Um, Obviously on ITU we give them all the drugs that can increase delirium to be able to get the patient's perspective to feel so small and not be able to do anything about those things and get my senses back to how they should be. It feels really um, disempowering so you, you can't do anything to help yourself at all. I think that'd be, that's a really good tool to teach delirium because it, I'll certainly go back into my practice and think about what I'm doing to patients, maybe take the extra few seconds to explain what I'm going to do of why I'm going to do it as well, which I think is important. It's not just about the what's going on, it's why you're doing those things to help try and rationalise in that patient's mind that isn't thinking rationally what is going on and where they are and what they're doing. Oh my God, she's terrified. Oh my God, she's terrified. When she hadn't got her glasses on, you could see things. I thought there was food on the table, but it wasn't food. It was actually just a blanket. So you can now understand why people are reaching for things and you know, you know, I would try and eat and drink out of things that you just think. I thought there were bananas on the table. It wasn't. It was blanket. Um, yes, it was actually quite scary. And then at one point, they, they wheeled a, a patient in, but it looked like a dead body because it was covered which would be absolutely petrifying. And nobody explained why they were wheeling people in and out. Um, so yeah, yeah, really quite scary. I think when I saw two people with the, with the virtual reality on, what struck me is that normally someone experiences delirium, you don't see, it's, it's invisible. But by having the virtual reality on, it's like that barrier between you and them and you realise how just isolated that person is because they, they've got this almost this barrier of the delirium surrounding them and it was it was just seeing that how vulnerable they are and how isolated but that must this just makes them and even if you, people approach them they're still disconnected the, the delirium's causing that layer of disconnect really that's what I observed I've noticed plenty of people with delirium um, so I think I'm aware of, of the process and the effect but I've never just seen that moment of vulnerability that moment of disconnect quite so clearly as just seeing it there really so listen, I'm, 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 I'm here with Dr. Becky Chubb from, from Combined Healthcare, who's the um, consultant psychiatrist um, with, uh, for older people. Yep. Uh, and the, uh, the VR training film that we've done was, in actual fact, uh, Becky's idea, completely Becky's idea. And hearing some of the reflections over the morning of people, of, of, of how they've experienced it and, 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 and what it's brought to them, the impact, you must be absolutely delighted. I am. Um, I'm, I'm so pleased. that The idea was to really put 
the person in the patient's shoes so that you really get to experience what it might be like to have an episode of delirium. And I think the other thing that I've, I've learned from you guys is that actually it's, it's really helpful as well to just see somebody else using the VR um, tool rather than just only experiencing yourself, which was something, is an added benefit I didn't realise. Uh, what have you learned from, from seeing that? I think just, it's another way of using it, isn't it? That you don't have to have the VR headset on, because it might not be for everybody. Not everybody feels comfortable putting the VR headset on, but actually there's still loads to be learned, even if you're in the room and you're learning with somebody else, which is fabulous.
Today is Brew Monday, the 16th of Jan. It's a time set aside to chat and make a plan. A day to pause, talk about your mental health and discuss those things you might leave on the shelf. So go, find a friend and ask to grab a brew and together let's stop and take a minute or two. Our spotlight section is our chance to shine a light on individuals, teams and their achievements and developments. We're really proud of our people at Combined and the amazing things they do, day in and day out. Here's our medical director, Dr Dennis Okolo, to introduce our next item. Many thanks, Claire. As Claire said, at Combined Healthcare, we want to shine a spotlight on the excellent and compassionate care we provide. I hope you enjoy this next item, which gives you just one further example of just how and why we are proud to be outstanding in all we do and how we do it. I'm Anne Melville, Head of Facilities. We're delighted that we um, are able to this year join in the celebrations for the National Estates and Facilities um, Day on the 15th of June. This is the first one that's actually taken place, but in recognition of all the good work that our services do. We've got some fantastic staff within our teams. Some of them have been with us for weeks, some of us for months, and some of us have been with us for decades. And they have really shone through, um, and, and they shine through on every day and when they deliver the services to us. I'd just like you to introduce you to some of the fantastic team that we have got. Yeah, my name's Bev, and I'm a catering assistant at the Harpers Hospital. I'm Gaydi, I work for support services. Yeah, my name's Simon Burke, um, I work for Serco, um, I'm a porter. Hello, my name's Wes Holdcroft, and I'm the States Operations Manager. Hello, my name's Mark Foxall, I uh, work for Estates and Facilities, Minor Works Officer. Hello, my name's Matthew Cadman, I'm an electrician, technical electrician for the Estates Farm. I work for Serco, and we um, sort the food out for the patients on the wards. Helping out everywhere, ma maintaining cleanliness standards and just making sure everything's kept and with the PP and everything's kept right and it all goes out correctly. For me, I, I notice estates and other people should notice estates and it's about the awareness. When you approach a building, you, you can see it, the grounds, the gardens, the tidiness as you go through the reception door, the cleanliness of it, the bright colours, the warm welcome. Um, obviously then we interact with the clinical staff but generally speaking the estates, the infrastructure, it's in a good state of repair. It, like I say, it's warm and welcoming and obviously that's what we pride ourselves on. Uh, my job title is entailed in taking clean linen, uh, picking dirty linen up, uh, doing pharmacy, um, all sorts basically, moving furniture, um, helping the trust out as much as we possibly can. Because if we didn't keep everywhere clean, we'd be in a, a bigger mess than we, you know, we would have been in the pandemic. It would have been, you know, and keeping everywhere clean and sanitised and making sure that, you know, it's clean for people and it's sanitised right. Basically, obviously, when we take stuff on the wards, we have contact with patients, they speak to us, they say hello. Nurses, doctors say hello to us. Um, we get complimented sometimes on uh, the job that we do by them. So it's enjoyable and obviously having contact with the patients as well, they know exactly what we do and um, they say thank you, you know, and ha happy customers. It was nice to come into the NHS um, to be nice and clean and dry for once. Um, working with all the different trades, which some people don't seem to realise that we've actually got a maintenance department to looking after our buildings, ranging from electricians, plumbers, building side, joinery. Um, I've been here for 27 years, like I've just said, it's because it's a nice place to work. Uh, I started working here in 2004 as a maintenance assistant. Um, three years into um, working for the Trust, I got the chance to do an apprenticeship, electrical apprenticeship, uh, which I took. Um, 
five years later, qualified electrician. And I've been working for the trust now for about 17 and a half years. So um, it's been good to me. They spent a lot of money on me, training me up and getting me to a good standard. And uh, this is basically my way of repaying them for putting their trust in me and spending all that money. So thanks very much for supporting me because they're very supportive, the staff here. Thank you to my managers because they're supportive as well. And yeah, that, that's it really. Yeah, the Estates and Facilities Day is a great idea, making awareness of what exactly we do within the trusts, um, making sure that all the electrical, plumbing, everything's safe for the staff and the patients to use, basically. It's porters, cleaning staff, janitors, caterers, you know, they're all behind the scenes. It's people you may not see, you know, because automatically people come to a hospital and expect to see nurses, doctors, uh, were sort of in the background and forgot about. Yeah, I, I think everybody does a great job, you know, from. Patient and service user stories are just one way in which we get to hear the voice of those we serve. Here's our Executive Director of Nursing, Kenny Lang, to introduce our next item. Many thanks, Claire. Hearing the experiences of our staff and service users, carers and their families, delivered by them in their own words, provides insights and knowledge in a way that goes beyond the mere printed word. We use stories at our trust board, our committees, internal and engagement events. We also use them extensively across the web, digital and social media platforms. And that includes, of course, here on CTV. If you have ideas of a staff, service user and or carer story, we need to hear it. Please get in touch with our patient experience facilitator or the comms team. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy the next item. I'm Chiara Barbaro um, and I first accessed a service in 2017 um, after I lost a baby in pregnancy. At the time um, you weren't able to access the parent and baby unit until you were 20 weeks pregnant, which has now changed and that is really good. So um, the first 20 weeks into my pregnancy were really hard. Um, but my community midwife was really good and she knew that I needed support because I really struggled to bond with baby and um, I had flashbacks and um, nightmares of my loss constantly so uh, everything was ready for me as soon as I got to 20 weeks I was referred actually even before I turned 20 weeks to the parent and baby unit and I still remember the first time I went to the coffee morning because at the time there was no COVID around so you could just you could just go in really um, and you didn't necessarily need to have a baby with you, you could go pregnant and I remember meeting um, the nursery nurses at the time and um, I met Nikki who was the team leader of the parent and baby and there was a lot of confusion at the start because I, because of my struggles with my mental health at the time, I was in between services, I was in between the Sutherland Centre and the parent and baby, uh, but I managed to get, to, to get accepted by the parent and baby after they had the Tuesday MDT meeting and so that was the start of my journey with them. I honestly don't think I would be here. And I don't just say it, you know, to sound cheesy or anything like that. I wouldn't be here without them. And I think the incredible thing about the, a service like the Parent and Baby Unit is that it's a whole team of people coming together and helping that mum and dad or partner um, as much as they possibly can. And it never, to me, I was with them from 20 weeks pregnant until my baby was one, so that's a long time and a bit after actually. It never felt like I was a patient to them, never. And now I, I realised the amount of care that they put. Um, and if you could see, like even just pictures of me when I first accessed the coffee morning and then when I got discharged, which was obviously very sad, 
I still remember that obviously these things end and it's good. So feeling empowered by a team of ladies, it was only ladies at the time, um, that made me feel like I could take on that grief because it was grief, 100%, accept it, not, not in a way of everything happens for a reason, which I didn't really like at the time, but I believe now. But how can we use that? to develop something that you believe in. And for me, that was being there for others, helping others, just like they did with me. Yeah, so after David, my, my rainbow boy, so rainbow babies are babies born after loss because they give you hope after the storm. After David was born, me and Nikki looked into setting up something and once he turned one, and obviously I got discharged by the parent and baby unit, I was well enough to look into that. And that October, we had the first face-to-face -face meeting with mums, and that's still going as of today. Um, so, yeah, I, it, it was quite intense, the support I had from the parent and baby.
together we're better. By working together in partnership with colleagues in the wider NHS, the care system, local government and the third sector, we achieve far more together than we can achieve alone. Here's just some examples of what's going on around our local system this week.
patient and service user stories are just one way in which we get to hear the voice of those we serve. Here's our Executive Director of Nursing, Kenny Lang, to introduce our next item. Many thanks, Claire. Hearing the experiences of our staff and service users, carers and their families, delivered by them in their own words, provides insights and knowledge in a way that goes beyond the mere printed word. We use stories at our trust board, our committees, internal and engagement events. We also use them extensively across the web, digital and social media platforms. And that includes, of course, here on CTV. If you have ideas of a staff, service user and or carer story, we need to hear it. Please get in touch with our patient experience facilitator or the comms team. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy the next item. And I am a fighter, which you probably understand, you know, you probably got by now and I phoned and phoned and phoned and I know a lot of people that don't have that um, strength or energy or I don't know and I, I feel for people like that and I, I feel that it's it's on us you know it's on me just because I managed to access it doesn't mean that I forgot about all the people that didn't I, I, I wouldn't say I wasn't happy with the Sutherland um, Everyone was really nice to me. Like I said, my therapist was really good. We worked really well together. She managed to make me better at the time, but it was a plaster. And no one thought we were gonna have a pandemic. With the pandemic, I, I crashed again and it was tough, but I've been accepted now and um, yeah. This trust, it came across as a family as um, it wasn't me and them because at the time I wasn't a peer support worker I was still a service user because I was already I was still um, using you know and the staff um, you know within the parent and baby definitely um, I'd, I'd say the whole mental health um, support I've had which I've had a lot um, always came across as approachable to me um, and I think, you know, building up from that, um, it, it is quite precious when you're a service user, quite, it, it is very important, that first contact, that first phone call, I've never come across anybody that wasn't welcoming, even when I was rejected, um, eventually they took the time to explain why I was rejected and, um, you know what they thought why then I was accepted actually I was explained why I was accepted and that I should have been accepted earlier and they weren't really um, afraid to apologize so that's another big thing I think so I know that the trust are working hard already to liaise with charities but there's definitely a lot more that can be done and I think that's where the peer support workers not just myself I know um, that there's more vacancies out there and actually um, they've hired a peer support worker um, recently um, for maternity. I think that that's where the peer support can really come in so I'm when I you know when I studied <laughs> revised for the interview more leaves mm -hmm. um, I these came across to me quite strongly and, and I remember thinking not just because I, I would have loved to get the job because I want to be a peer, peer support worker but in this trust I wanted to be one um, I remember reading about being the only outstanding mental health um, service um, of two in the UK is it right I forgot now anyway and that that struck me again and, and I, I wasn't surprised when I talk to some, you know, ladies that live in different tr in, in different places in the UK, and I tell them what we do here, they are quite shocked in, like, in a good way. I thought that, for example, in London, services were much better, but they're not. At least in the trust where some of my mums are, there's nothing like this. 
So I sometimes I say, just move to Stoke. <laughs> we'll take you on. So it is, uh, I am very, very, very proud, very proud um, to be part of it. And um, I cannot wait to get going and, and you know, I improve it. Our spotlight section is our chance to shine a light on individuals, teams and their achievements and developments. We're really proud of our people at Combined and the amazing things they do, day in and day out. Here's our medical director, Dr Dennis Okolo, to introduce our next item. Many thanks Claire. As Claire said, at Combined Healthcare we want to shine a spotlight on the excellent and compassionate care we provide. I hope you enjoy this next item, which gives you just one further example of just how and why we are proud to be outstanding in all we do and how we do it. I'm Anne Melville, Head of Facilities. We're delighted that we um, are able to this year join in the celebrations for the National Estates and Facilities um, Day on the 15th of June. This is the first one that's actually taken place, but in recognition of all the good work that our services do. we've got some fantastic staff within our teams. Some of them have been with us for weeks, some of us for months, and some of us have been with us for decades. And they have really shone through, um, and, and they shine through on every day and when they deliver the services to us. I'd just like you to introduce you to some of the fantastic team that we have got. Yeah, my name's Bev, and I'm a catering assistant at the Harpers Hospital. I'm Gaydy, I work for support services. Yeah, my name's Simon Burke, um, I work for Serco, um, I'm a porter. Hello, my name's Wes Holdcroft, I'm the States Operations Manager. Hello, my name's Mark Foxall, I uh, work for Estates and Facilities, Minor Works Officer. Hello, my name's Matthew Cadman, I'm an electrician, technical electrician for the Estates Department. 
I work for Serco and we um, sort the food out for the patients on the wards. Helping out everywhere, maintaining cleanliness standards and just making sure everything's kept and with the PP and everything's kept right and it all goes out correctly. For me, I, I notice estates and other people should notice estates and it's about the awareness. When you approach a building, you, you can see it, the grounds, the gardens, the tidiness as you go through the reception door, the cleanliness of it, the bright colours, the warm welcome. Um, obviously then we interact with the clinical staff, but generally speaking, the estates, the infrastructure, it's in a good state of repair. It, like I say, it's warm and welcoming and obviously that's what we pride ourselves on. Uh, my job title is entitled in taking clean linen, uh, picking dirty linen up, uh, doing pharmacy, um, all sorts basically, moving furniture, um, helping the trust out as much as we possibly can. Because if we didn't keep everywhere clean, we'd be in a, a bigger mess than we, you know, we would have been in the pandemic, it would have been, you know, keeping everywhere clean and sanitised and making sure that, you know, it's clean for people and it's sanitised right. Basically, obviously, when we take stuff on the wards, we have contact with patients, they speak to us, they say hello. Nurses, doctors say hello to us. Um, we get complimented sometimes on uh, the job that we do by them. So it's enjoyable and obviously having contact with the patients as well, they know exactly what we do and um, they say thank you, you know, and ha happy customers. It was nice to come into the NHS um, to be nice and clean and dry for once. Um, working with all the different trades, which some people don't seem to realise that we've actually got a maintenance department to looking after our buildings, ranging from electricians, plumbers, building side, joinery. Um, I've been here for 27 years, like I've just said, it's because it's a nice place to work. Uh, I started working here in 2004 as a maintenance assistant. Um, three years into um, working for the Trust, I got the chance to do an apprenticeship, electrical apprenticeship, uh, which I took. Um, five years later, qualified electrician, and I've been working for the Trust now for about 17 and a half years. So um, it's been good to me, they spent a lot of money on me, training me up and getting me to a good standard. And uh, this is basically my way of repaying them they're putting their trust in me and spending all that money. So thanks very much for supporting me because they're very supportive, the staff here. Thank you to my managers because they're supportive as well. And yeah, that, that's it really. Yeah, the Estates and Facilities Day is a great idea, making awareness of what exactly we do within the trusts, um, making sure that all the electrical, plumbing, everything's safe for the staff and the patients to use, basically. It's porters, cleaning staff, janitors, caterers, you know, they're all behind the scenes. It's people you may not see, you know, because automatically people come to a hospital and expect to see nurses, doctors, uh, were sort of in the background and forgot about. Yeah, I, I think everybody does a great job, you know, from... I'm Emma Jones, I'm the service manager for the Oz Mental Health Service that sits within primary care, um, and the team is a newly developed service um, that's been going, I think we're in a second year, and it's part of the community mental health transformation and the mental health support offer within primary care. Hello, my name's Eve Homer. I'm a mental health practitioner. Um, I work within moorlands and rural area, um, covering seven practices within that area. And I'm Chris Deville and I work in the South Newcastle PCN. I'm a mental health nurse by background and I cover six practices within the Newcastle and sort of more rural areas around there. Ours stands for Additional Roles Reimbursement Scheme um, and it's part of the community mental health, well, transformation um, um, in terms of the mental health practitioners but there are also other Rs roles that sit within primary care so each primary care network um, has got roles such as a, an occupational therapist, um, social prescribers, health and wellbeing practitioners, paramedics, pharmacists um, so we all sort of work together um, within primary care to provide that sort of multidisciplinary um, approach to mental health um, assessment, guidance, support and interventions within a primary care setting.
we've got um, there's 13 primary care networks that we um, cover so across North Staffordshire and Stoke um, we've got 13 mental health practitioners that are aligned to each primary care network within each primary care network um, there's an average of sort of five to six um, GP practices um, and then we've got um, support time and recovery workers that are aligned with the mental health um, practitioner um, to each PCN to offer a um, recovery focused um, approach to support mental health. The objectives obviously are to provide earlier intervention for people with mental health who are experiencing mental health difficulties. Um, obviously that will aid combined in the sense that we're looking at not as many people needing to go to places like access services, uh, hopefully reducing the pressures on those teams, but also providing a smoother pathway for people and hopefully that trusted assessment so that we can see somebody in a primary care setting. And should we feel that they need something such as CAMS or um, community team support, then we can refer directly to them rather than having to see somebody in primary care, somebody at the access team, somebody, and then they have to have another assessment again. So it's about improving the patient journey. What we're hoping to, to do is um, see people who fall between primary and secondary care. So if, if a patient has been within secondary services, um, the discharge pathway can include ourselves, it can be a step down to ourselves. Um, also if someone's come from primary care and we feel that they need extra support we can we can provide an intervention and if we've seen someone you know several times we feel that this still isn't isn't quite the right um, treatment um, the correct care we can then step up and um, someone can go through to secondary services so we are sitting in between the two. Generally we are very different all the PCNs work differently they all need something slightly different based on their population so actually people's days are quite varying. We check out sort of any information about the patient that we need to make sure we're up to date see if they're under any services currently and then obviously when we see them if we haven't seen them before we'll do our assessment and obviously decide you know does this person need an onward referral to, to secondary or do they need some other support or as Eve said can we provide some support um, in the form of a brief intervention. Yeah, just to add, I think there's quite a lot of liaison as well with voluntary services, um, secondary services, drug and alcohol services, wellbeing, you know, we do um, a lot of communication really between the different services out there and, and refer on or needed. There is a lot, a lot of patients, I believe, do know we're there. I think a lot of the, obviously the GPs, it's been about getting the information out over the course of the team's been established, so the GPs are sort of aware that we're there, the other practitioners from the PCN are aware, so we sort of people get referred into our diary, if you will, from all sorts of directions. Generally, patients are aware, but obviously the more we can do to, to get the name of the team out there so people are more aware of us, the better. You know? I think I think we're being promoted in in the surgery reception areas yeah. now, and there's there's lots we have of a Twitter. yeah we have a Twitter page um, yeah there's 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 lots more communication I think now that we've been established for twelve months just a little bit over um, the awareness has definitely increased I think I think as we've sort of established established yourself more and the teams are growing um, they're, they're going to become more frequent but just from from a personal perspective they were it was um, someone came to the practice and the previous they'd had a long period of being unwell and um, had stopped taking the medication and it was it was actually over the Christmas period last year and, and they were extremely stressed because it, it was at that time of year and it was the speed that they were able to be seen by a practitioner so they'd seen the GP a couple of days before they were able to be put into my clinic we were able to initiate a medication whilst <clears throat> at, at that particular time um, and also link into pre this particular person had come from out of area, but we were able to get information about them. So rather than go down the route of going to the GP and then being sent on to the crisis care centre and and 
you know, having to repeat themselves, go through numerous assessments, the treatment was actually sought in that hour appointment. So that was that was a really successful, uh, and the follow up was provided for the person as well, and it was all in in house really, so that the person didn't need to go through to secondary services. It was provided by primary care. If this team and this transformation programme hadn't been in place, they definitely would have would have ended up seeing definitely gone to crisis care and then onto the, the CMHT.